My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Members to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. I've found that it isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Rick Cromey. He is the author of Gentech, an American story of technology, change, and who we really are. He is a best selling author, international speaker, cultural historian, professor, and pastor. His mission is to help people interpret history, navigate culture, and explore faith to create trusted and transformative change. He's authored over a dozen books, including his most recent work, which I mentioned. That is uh, Gen Tech, an American story of technology. So I'll have Dr. Rick's uh, websites up in the show notes. So anybody listening uh, afterwards, you can check him out, uh, connect with him. And uh, just really been looking forward to speaking with you and and uh, getting to know a little bit more about your story and really what led you to do what you're doing now. Well, first of all, thank you, David, for the opportunity to be on your uh, podcast and to share with your listeners all out there in podcast world, podcast land. It's it's always good to uh, to communicate and to share your your messages that uh, you have. But uh, yeah, I've I've been looking forward to this conversation with you, uh, and especially uh, again, thank you for your service and the, the work that you've done. Been doing a little study on you. You've had quite a bit of success in your own life as far as uh, uh, the work that you've done, and uh, I just appreciate. Appreciate what you've done and your contributions to our community and to our nation. Thank you for saying that. Um, well, let's uh, let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, I, I'd like to get a sense of, of where you come from, your background. Like, where where were you born and raised? I am originally from uh, Central Montana, a little small town and in, in called Lewistown, Montana, middle of nowhere. Uh, all the big cities were around us, Boat, uh, Butte and Bozeman and Billings and Great Falls. And, you know, I was nowhere near any of those big towns. So I was pretty secluded and uh, grew up pretty much. It was a Norman Rockwell type of hometown living and, I, I you know, fairly secure, fairly protected, fairly safe. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was that was where I was born and raised. What did uh, what your mom and dad do when you were growing up? My dad was a trucker. And I saw him, uh, you know, I used to say I grew up ADD, absent dad disorder, because pretty much the only time I saw him was on the weekends. Uh, and he, he was a good dad. Uh, he had his own struggles. Uh, I think a lot of us, when we come into a, a parenting relationship in particular, we tend to bring a lot of our past. And his dad was pretty hard on him, and he tended to be pretty hard on me. And uh, I look back on it now, and I'm thankful for some of that hardness because it it really uh, it really strengthened me. But uh, he was abusive in many ways as well. Uh, at least in in my early days, uh, we've since reconciled a lot of that, and uh, he's he's uh, basically asked for forgiveness for a lot of those things. And uh, I, of course, granted that, and you know we've we've moved on. And um, but yeah, there was there was some times where it was really tough. Uh, when I, my mom was a uh, was a stay at home mom most of my early days, and and then she um, she abandoned the family when I was twelve, and that became a huge a wounding upon my life. I say a scar because I, I'm not, I almost said a scar, but really it was a wounding that was a scab for many years. You know, a scab you tend to pick at and it bleeds again, and and that was really uh, prime, pretty much for forty years of my life I kept that one alive. But it was anger and and such. And, you know, I, I, the whole theme of your podcast is from, you know, embers to excellence and, you know, I, to, to have an abusive dad and to, to experience abandonment with your mother uh, is, is really difficult. And then after 30 years of marriage, I actually, you know, went through a, a horrific divorce and, and that itself, you know, a, a second abandonment, but it was out of all of that, that I found uh, my faith. Uh, I found my uh, uh, sense of who I really was. And I think that's really a, the, the 
the the heartbeat message that I like to bring to people is that you know we're, we're all on a search, we're all on a uh, an exploration, a journey to find out who we really are. And you know, I, I actually, as a pastor, I got to tell you, I've talked to a lot of people who who really struggle with their self identity, and, and many of them never do find out. You know, they they go to their deathbed with that question, who who in the world am I? And I just decided a long time ago I wanted to resolve that. I know exactly who I am, and once I you know, came to grips with that, uh, all the other stuff that, that I struggled with, including reconciling with my mother uh, it, and all, and my dad, th those things went away. It's incredible. I mean, we like really dove in deep here. Uh, have, have you read that book, A um, uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl? You know, I, yeah, it's an amazing book. And you know, that was, that's one of those areas that's kind of outside my own study. And, you know, I have a short list of really, it's actually a long list now of books that I, I hope to someday read. But, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people recommend that book to me. And uh, I've, I probably ought to just go ahead and, and, and read it. But very familiar with the author, familiar with some of his uh, ideas and such. But uh, no, I've never read the book. Well, then let me let me just ask this question, because, I, you know, I, I've struggled with that, that identifying who I am, there's yeah, you can uh, relate who you are to to what you do, your occupation, that kind of thing. And then, but the reality is, is that what you do in life changes throughout your life. Um, how you identify a lot of times, especially when people are are successful um, in whatever craft they have, and they identify as that. And then when they no longer do that, they struggle with you know, who in the world am I? So um, I like to ask that question when people have that confidence mm. in them as to be able to say, this is who I am. Yeah. So, so what, what conclusions did you come to? Well, you know, it's interesting. You, you bring this, bring this, I, I'm a student of, of culture and I love biographies. I do a lot of bio, history biographies and, and reading and, and watching. And I just watched a, a biography on uh, Walter Payton and, you know, one of the, one of, if not the most successful uh, uh, runners in the NFL, and he was highly successful his entire career uh, with the exception of the Super Bowl and what was it, 1983, 84, where, you know, he, he got overshadowed by William, the refrigerator Perry, and uh, didn't even get a, I think he only had like 10 or 12 carries in that Super Bowl. And he carried that team all year long. And, and in the Super Bowl, they, his coach did actually let him down. He had a chance for a Super Bowl carry into the end zone, and didn't get it. But after he retired and he was having liver issues in his life, after he retired, they, they say the last 10 years of Walter's Payton, Payton's life were miserable. Uh, he had, he had literally his whole identity was around being a football player. And now he didn't know what to do. He tried on different, he went, he drove cars, uh, sports cars uh, in races. He did, uh, he did uh, some dancing and so, he did a lot of different things, but he never really knew who he was off of the gridiron. And I can relate to that. Uh, I was a I was a youth pastor for many years. I literally my entire world was church uh, for for all my life, and and then I went into the professorate. I was a, a professor teacher, and I did that for fifteen years. And then the recession hit, and I had just earned my doctorate. I really was at that point. My this was two thousand seven, David. I was making a making the most money I'd ever made in my life. Uh, my the phone never stopped ringing. I had all sorts of opportunities, speaking all over the nation. And then the recession hit and the job I was in went away. And suddenly I'm unemployed. I'm 45 years old. I have too much education, I'm told. I have too much experience. I couldn't get anybody to hire me. My, my entire, you know, the whole area where I was a, a professor uh, transformed overnight. It became a more of an adjunct position in many schools rather than a full-time professor position. Bottom line was, I remember sitting one day, I was literally in the bathtub. I'd drawn a bath and I soaked in that bathtub for, for probably an hour, um, commiserating, wondering what in the world that God was doing in my life. What, what I, wh why was I even here? What was this all about? You know, and I just, I just realized that, you know, I have a choice to make at this point. I can choose to get out of this tub and 
find something to do today that's meaningful. And that's why I tell anybody, do the next right thing. Just find meaning in this moment. If nothing else, then having a podcast interview with some guy you don't know. You know, find meaning in this moment. Do something productive every day. That was what? That was 2007. What's that? Uh, 2022 now? You know, 15, 15 years ago. I, I I never dreamed that I would have a productive career outside of that. I defined my entire life by my education, by my career, by my, and, and again, by my family. I was a family man. And then when my family, my kids all grew up and went away and you know went to college and left home and got married and had kids of their own. And, and my, my ex-wife divorced me. And it was, I went through a lot of stuff as far as what defines us. And that's the problem. If you put your identity in other people, in your career, in stuff, a lot of men do this. A lot of men in particular, we like to put it into our stuff, you know, and you know, things that we own and the things that we do. Uh, you'll be miserable when those things go away and they will eventually go away. Uh, a lot of men put their, and a lot of people, not just men, men and women put their uh, uh, identity into their health. You know, they have, they have great physiques and they're strong and healthy. What will you do when that health is no longer there? You know, you have to have something deeper. And to me, that's the existential search of mankind that Viktor Frankl speaks to, obviously. But I myself found it within my relationship with, with Jesus Christ. You know, that's, that's really where I found my, my strength. It was something bigger than me that I needed to have. So, you know, that's why I talk about exploring faith. You know, you don't even have to be a Christian. It might be something else, but it has to be something bigger than you that you, you find to give you meaning and purpose and, and heart. So can can you go ahead and like I I want to know how you how you define yourself like you know who 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 are you Yeah Well I think if there's one word that that has uh, emerged in the last 10 years and it, it would be the word grace uh, when you grow up in a very religious home and you you spend a lot of time and uh, you know, with, um, with a very conservative background with, with religion in particular, there's a lot of laws, there's a lot of rules that you have to kind of obey and the, the, the do's and the don'ts, if you will, that, that drive a lot of people crazy. I just want you to know that's churchianity. That's not Christianity. Uh, what, what, I, what I love about Christianity more than anything is that I have found in it a freedom to be who I really am. Uh, the, the heartbeat message of Christianity is that there's grace. There's nothing you can do religiously, spiritually. You can't sacrifice enough. You can't do enough. You can't pray enough. You can't, you can't be good enough for God. That's the message. It's, it's the bad news of Christianity. The bad news is you can't be good enough. The good news is because of Jesus, who was perfect. This is the story, whether you agree with it or not. This is the story. Because of that, I put my faith in Jesus, and Jesus then gives me the strength to, to go through the messy parts of my life, the failures, uh, the, the times where other people hurt me. You know, my, my favorite phrase of Jesus is from the cross, where he, you know, he, he's being crucified uh, by people that were, were really supposed to defend him. It wasn't just the Romans who drove the nails that day. It was the Jewish religious leaders who convicted him, who, who put him on that cross. And yet he looked down at these people and he said to, to all of them, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. That blows my mind. I mean, he could have called that. I mean, if you believe he was God, as I do, he could have, he could have called down a million angels at that point and just blown the whole place up said, forget this. What am I doing here? You know, if this is really God in the flesh, which is a mystery to me, and he's on this cross, he could have done so many things at that point to really settle the score. Instead, he forgives. And to me, that's what I've learned. I've learned in the last 10 years to forgive, to forgive the hurts, to forgive the habits, to forgive the hangups, that, that have driven my life, to forget the people that have hurt me, to forgive myself of, of, of all people. I have to sometimes have to forgive myself, you know, because, uh, you know, I can sometimes be very unforgivable. So grace, 
drives all of that. So if you want to know in a word who I am, that's what it is. It's grace, which is messy and murky and doesn't make sense and is unreasonable. And yet it's a beautiful way to live. What, what in your life right now uh, gives you purpose? Yeah. Actually, what I'm doing right now, this is what's given me purpose. Uh, about, um, about nine months or so ago, I was trying to figure out a new way to promote my book and to, to get my message out there because COVID, I, 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 you write a book and, and really, uh, to be honest, this is my, my, the favorite book of all the books I've ever written. This is my favorite. It gets incredible reviews and yet it's a complete failure as far as sales. Uh, it's just, it has, it has sold peen, you know, just, just nothing. And in many ways, you know, you can look at that and go, oh, well, if I define myself by my book sales, I'm a complete failure, but I'm not. And about nine months ago, I was trying to think, what are some new ways just to get my, I just got to reboot this thing. Let's figure it out and, and do something different. And cause you know, I think it was Einstein who said that, you know, insanity is, is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And I was just going insane, trying to promote a book the old way. And it wasn't working in the COVID moment. So um, I, someone suggested podcasting and guesting on podcasts. And I'd done a few at that point, but uh, I thought, okay, let's give this a shot. So I got into, I think you and I met on Podmatch, a little kind of like the e-harmony of podcasters and podcast hosts. And so that's where I got, I, I just went on there and put on a little bit of money to, to get on. And I thought, well, let's see where this goes. And since then, I, I probably have done almost a hundred interviews uh, and I have had amazing conversations. Sometimes I talk about my story, like with you. Sometimes I talk about my book. Sometimes I talk about leadership and, you know, I'm a, I'm a leader's leader and a, and a teacher's teacher. I'm a, as I have all sorts of different areas and angles I can go. So every day, you know, what, what gives me purpose and meaning is I get up, I spend some time with God. I spend some time just centering my life. And then I find a way to inspire somebody. And last month, all I did was write biographies on, on Black people on black uh, individuals that we have never, ever heard of. Most people have heard of Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King and uh, all those individuals, great individuals. But I decided to write on the Clara Browns, uh, the, um, the, the Leedsdorfs and um, the, the, the Biddy Masons that were out there, people that we've never even heard of, who literally became self-made millionaires. They influenced the nation in a number of ways, uh, they, they just amazing stories that you never have heard of. And I just post those on Facebook for free through my, um, through my account. And I've got a little podcast or a blog that I do. And I started writing, putting that up there and it, it just resonated. And I just find if I can, you know, I'll just write something. I say something, I do something tomorrow or excuse me, Thursday, a couple of days, I'm going to be speaking for a bunch of teens over here in twin falls, Idaho. And, you know, just a couple hundred people and a couple hundred kids. And, and I'm going to actually probably talk to them about a lot of what I'm sharing with you, uh, just overcoming failures in life. You know, these are kids and they think that, you know, that, that the world's their oyster and it is, but you're going to find when you open up that oyster and that shell, there may not be much in there. And you may actually have to find a different oyster. <laughs> you know, we just you never know what's going to happen. With your life growing up, what led you into the ministry and, and really what, what motivated you so much to, to become a professor? <laughs> well, for, first of all, those are kind of different questions because uh, I was the type of kid that got into a lot of trouble when I was in, in a little guy. I, was, I, was, I always tell the teachers, I said, I was the kid you would not want to have in your class. Most people tend to see you as who you are, especially if they, I, I, let me back up there. The, one of the problems that we have in our reputation, especially the older we get, is that you have two types of people. There are people who see you as you are now, and all they see is your success, and they're blind to all the failures that it took to get you to that success. And then there are those people that knew you back when, when you really were a mess and a muck up, and <laughs> and you you were uh, you were you made mistakes, and they they tend to remember you and define you by those rather than seeing that you can change. And both of those types tend to discourage me. 
You know, I, I want people to know that I'm not perfect. Even today, I'm not perfect. As a leader, I still make mistakes. As a teacher, I still make mistakes. As a pastor, I still make mistakes. But um, I'm also not the same person I was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever. So you ask, how did I get involved with ministry? Well, for me, it was very natural. I, I literally grew up in the church. The third person to ever hold me in this life was my preacher. Um, you know, it was my, my mom, my grandma, and then the preacher. And he, the first male to hold me was my preacher. And I was in church the very next Sunday. And, and I just grew up in a hardback pew in the back of a very small church there in central Montana. And then, um, you know, my grandmother was a huge influence on my life. After the abandonment of my mother, we went to live with my grandparents and my grandmother, you know, she was, um, she was my rock, if you will. She was the center of my life. And that was one of the things that she did was she really focused me and encouraged me in my faith and kept me, kept me, kept all of us kids that, you know, that my siblings as well. Um, as far as the professor goes, uh, and I guess back to the ministry, then I just, it was natural for me just to go on. And I, I went really to, to Bible college to study uh, the Bible and to become a pastor simply because it was the next way of of just it was natural for me and I, I didn't tell a lot of a lot of people that my church knew about it but you know I was kind of going because my grandmother really wanted us to go and I said okay I'll do that and I went one year and you know I just I just realized this is this is the best fit for me right now as far as the professor it goes I didn't even imagine that um I didn't I didn't see that one coming I was um I was an average student through through you know my elementary and high school years um, I was very good at certain things. You know, I'm a, I'm an artist, a photographer, writer, speaker. I found out later, you know, there are certain things that just kind of got a hold of me and I did well in those type of classes, but math, science, you know, all those, all those hard psychology, you know, I just, I had no interest. And so I didn't do very well. When I went to college, uh, you know, if I didn't want to study, I just didn't study. I had kind of a very natural brain where, you know, I could learn things fairly quickly and remember them. And, you know, I could get through a test for the moment. But if I wasn't interested in it, I just kind of eh, forget it. And I almost flunked out my first year of college. I almost went home. And, you know, I just decided, well, if I'm going to stick around for another year, I might as well and have to take all these classes over. I might as well buckle down and study and and it just all came together. I started, I realized when I got a couple A's in my, my schooling in college that I could actually do this work. And I thought, okay, well, let's apply myself. And at that point, things really started to take off. And when I graduated from college, it was just natural to go on to, to graduate school and work on a master's degree. And, and uh, long story short, I, I just, I was so successful in ministry. And once I got my master's degree that uh, there were there were schools that were very interested in having me teach, and the irony is I was only 28 years old at the time. I often look back on that and go, you know, I I succeeded. I wrote my first nationally published book at 25 years of age. I sometimes think I had too much success too soon. You know, a lot of people build success. I had it right out of the gate. I've always had, you know, in the early days, my success was was right there. Everything I touched was golden. I had all sorts of opportunity. But when I hit 40 and, you know, just things started to happen, you know, the wheels started to come off the cart, you might say. And then, of course, the Great Recession and all that. Um, the good news is over all those years, I built this amazing network, especially as a professor. So I had this network of people that where I could go and speak, I could go and teach, I could kind of keep things going. Um, but yeah, I, I, I hit the very bottom, you know, at that part of my story, you know, 20, 2015, 2014, I was literally going to a food bank uh, to get food for, for my family and, and myself, you know, and then the divorce in 2014 didn't help out. Uh, lost a third of my income overnight uh, from schools and churches that no longer wanted to employ a divorced pastor, you know, so I've seen the bottom. I know what it's like to be flat in your back. And I, you know, I, I it, it's, it, it, now it's made me a stronger person. Yeah. And, you know, I, I uh, to quote Forrest Gump, that's about all I have to say about that. <laughs> Do you have siblings? 
I do. I have a, I have a younger brother and he's about a year and a half younger than I am. And he, uh, he lives over in Washington state. And I have a, a, a sister who lives in uh, Billings, Montana. And another sister lives in Bozeman, Montana. She was the baby of the family though, the youngest. And so she grew up not having a lot of the, the, the woundings that I had from, from the abandonment of my mother and, and stuff. She did, she grew up with the grandparents being her, being her mom and dad. And I, you know, in many ways she, she had such a different experience that she's a different person as a result. Yeah. Are you the oldest? I am the oldest. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so, the alpha male. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, you don't, we don't need to go into it if you don't want to, but um, over the past couple of weeks, I've actually talked to several people that experienced some abandonment like that by one or both of their parents. And just wondering at, at 12 years old, how, how that affected you to have your, your mother leave and um, how was it communicated to you? Like, I'm sure you had a lot of questions and, and, you know, now you're, you got your siblings with you. And I, I just, I'm, I'm curious how you dealt with that as a 12 year old. Well, yeah. You know, the, the hard story, the, 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 the timeline, you know, I was in junior high it was, you know, which is the worst time to have something like this happen to you. You know, I'm a, I'm a short guy as it is. And uh, back then I was kind of a, I was kind of a goober. <laughs> You know, I just didn't, uh, I, I wasn't one of these kids that ran with the popular kids. Um, you know, I just, in fact, I was funny. I just had my 40th high school reunion here last summer and, and it was amazing. There were, there were ladies there and, and guys as well that were having conversations with that never would have talked to me in high school. You know, they just, I, I was that kid that just was, you know, I, 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 I didn't run in those groups. And, uh, you know, in our, in our school, we had two types of people. We had the jocks and we had the athletic supporters. I was, was kind of in between. I was part jock. I was part athletic supporter. You know? I, uh, I played football, but then I went from the football, um, you know, football arena to the stage. I was a theater guy. And that's really what made me who I am. You know, a lot of people say, well, how did you, how did you find who you really are? Well, I, I, I was on the stage for years. And I, that's how I started to play my life out because I found that when I was on the stage, I could be somebody else. I could put on a mask. Uh, I could hide myself from all that hurt. You asked what it was like. Uh, well, I came home from junior high. I was the one that kind of discovered they were missing uh, or my mom was missing because I came home from junior high and the car wasn't there. And we started doing some investigation. We broke into the house and, and, she was gone. There was no note, nothing. She was just gone. House was a total mess. Uh, in fact, uh, I was one of the, um, I was the only sibling that went in there. I had to identify some stuff for my, for, for my grandparents and just, just make sure. And a lot of stuff was stolen from us. It was very, very hurtful. In fact, because of what I saw and because of what happened and we had no idea where she was at, um, you know, six months later, she finally calls the house. I think it was Easter Sunday. She calls to tell us how much she loves us as kids. And, you know, I remember my, my younger sister and brother getting on the phone, having a, a little conversation with her. And, and I knew that I, this was not going to go well. And she wanted to talk to me. She wanted to tell me how much she loved me. And I told her on that day that, um, um, you know, first of all, I hate you. And I will hate you to the day I die. You know, you ruined my life. You ruined our family's life. We, she had literally, we, she had surfaced in Houston, Texas, which was about as far away from Montana as you can get. And I just was like, I don't want anything, you know, I don't want anything to do with you. And I carried that hurt. This is why I tell people you can carry those hurts. And for me, it was like a big beach ball that you know, I tried to keep underwater. I didn't want other people to see my beach ball. So I kept pushing it underwater, but every now and then it would get away from me and cause a, I would just blow up. I had a terrible temper sometimes still do, you know, but this beach ball would explode and I would explode and, and I, just for little silly things. And a lot of it was driven by my fear that I would get rejected again. And that became a driving theme of my life. I was successful. So I wouldn't be rejected and I, I succeeded. So I would not fail. I, I literally papered and put a big, uh, you know, wall around my life to keep me from 
failure, to keep me from being rejected, to keep me from being hurt. And the problem was whenever I sensed that I was going to fail, I just quit. Whenever I sensed that I was going to be rejected, I would reject first. I had a lot of girlfriends in high school that, that we, we only went so far. And then I said, you know what? I don't want to be hurt by you. And I didn't tell them this. I just said, we're done. You know, it just, it just wasn't, uh, you know, and so I would hurt before I got hurt. I would reject before I got rejected. I would leave before I got left. And that, that really drove a lot of my relationships. It drove a lot of my career, you know, decisions. A lot of times I would leave jobs before, if I would just fight through it, I would have been okay, but I didn't know how to fight. All I knew was how to run. All I knew was how to escape before I got hurt again. And those are the things in leadership now that, you know, my doctorates in leadership, I, I literally spent three years of my life studying the finer nuances of, of leadership. And one of the things I've learned is that leaders have to fight through those moments where they want to leave. Um, you know, I often say if the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence, it's time to water and fertilize your own lawn, you know, fix your own lawn first, you know, you know, don't, don't be running to something, you know, if something draws you, that's different, but uh, don't run. So it drove my whole life. And it wasn't until about age 50 that, uh, which was nine years ago for me, uh, that uh, things started to change. Do you know why she left? Why my mom left? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, um, she, she left for a variety of reasons. She was, um, she had fallen into alcohol and drug abuse and uh, she just met another guy and uh, uh, they ran off together. And the irony is, is that her marriage to my dad was not good at all. I mean, again, she was a, she was a trucker's wife widow and it was, it was hard for her. And, and I think my dad recognizes that now all those years ago. Um, but, you know, she tore up the family. But at the same time, the guy that she met and ran off with turned out to be her soulmate. And that was something else that really kind of worked on me over the years was that um, I, I could see that her marriage, her new marriage was actually a working relationship. And it was it was productive and it was good. And that started to soften me. And of course, as I went through my 20s and even my 30s, I started to realize that I couldn't hate my mom. You know, I can't be a good Christian pastor and hate my mom. <laughs> so I just changed it. You know, she, we, we did finally reconcile a little bit where, you know, when I was home in Montana, we would, we would meet and, and uh, I talked with her on the phone quite a bit. And she would often try to say, you know, she would say to me, I love you. And and a few times she tried to pressure me a little bit. And I just said, mom, I'm going to let you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to show my love by what I do. I'm going to love you as, as a Christian. I'm going to love you as, as much as I can. Uh, but that love is not going to be with words. It's going to be with actions. And, you know, that's all I can give you right now. And, you know, I, I essentially told her, I said, the three words that you're not going to hear that you want to hear, uh, you're not going to hear before you die is the words are the words. I love you. And, you know, again, that was a shift from I hate you, <laughs> but at the same time, the forgiveness, the unforgiveness was still in my heart and in my life. And it drove a lot of bad choices. It drove a lot of, I, I, I often look at my former marriage through that lens. Had I, had I really, you know, there were so many red flags that said this relationship's not going to work, but I was so afraid of being abandoned again. And she seemed so, she would keep coming back. And, you know, we broke up two or three times my first year we were together and I just kept going back and I was so afraid of being abandoned. And, you know, I, I was, my, my feelings, I was running with my feelings and we spent 30 years together, but by the end we were just roommates. You know, that was all it was. And it was, it was kind of a very slow fade of, of a relationship to nothing. And, you know, she's a good woman uh, to this day. You know, she, she's very, she's successful, successful in her own right and is a good woman. But um, I realized when I turned 50 that I had to deal with these hurts, habits, and hangups. And so I entered some recovery work, uh, uh, actually through a church uh, work, a uh, uh, church that was doing, it's called Celebrate Recovery. It's, it's a Christian-based recovery group. And I did some, some soul searching with them, did a couple step studies and, and really went through the process. And I threw myself wholeheartedly into this because I wanted to really work on this, on this hurt. 
And I realized um, that the only way I was going to get past it was by forgiving my mom. I mean, part of the process of recovery is the amends process point. And that's where you ask for forgiveness and you forgive the people who've hurt you. And, you know, David, that's what I did. Uh, one, uh, one May, uh, I think it was 2014, 20, it would have been 2014. I called my mom and I just said, mom, it was mother's day. And I said, mom, I'm going to give you the gift you've been waiting for all your life. And, um, I just want you to know that I love you. And I want to, uh, I want to just say that uh, I care about you and I want to spend the rest of my life and the rest of your life caring about you and loving you. And, 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 and let's, let's, let's just wipe the slate clean today. That was my mother's day gift to her. And we had the best conversation, David, after that, it was an amazing conversation. The, um, the end of the story is that about a year, year and a half later, she passed away. And I realize now that, that was um, a turning point for me. I realized that I, you know, every day now to me is a day that, you know, I don't go to bed at night without going through the day and asking for forgiveness. And if there's somebody that I need to, act, to, to ask for forgiveness for, you know, something I've done to somebody else, I work hard to make those amends in the moment. Um, I want to live as honestly and as purely and as good as possible every day I have. Every day I'm vertical and above ground. I want it to be a good day. And you can't spell good without God, by the way. Uh, for me, you got to have that in there. But um, it just, it worked. But it starts by forgiving. I had to forgive the hurts. I had to forgive those who were hurting me and have hurt me. One of the things that I, I want to go back to, because um, I, I believe that it's all tied together. I really do. You, hey, you're you, like my therapist today, David. I, I, I was, <laughs> I was coming in here to talk about my book and we're, we're talking about my, <laughs> my life. I was like, okay, well, let's, let's, let's we'll, we'll go this way. Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> well, so I, I really feel like how we lead yeah. is, is really tied to, to our life and, and who we are and those things where we you know, the, the, the turmoil that we've dealt in our lives can really help us be empathetic to those that are struggling with those same things. And, and when we're in a leadership position and we're, we're, you know, we're serving the people that we lead to help them through those tough times and to help them experience success in whatever way that they, they are searching for. But you you ended up on this path well you you were a leader in your church you were a leader in the classroom and and you went into studying leadership and um, and then writing about it teaching it and and i just it it really strikes me as, as very interesting that you worked towards you know that that teaching teachers how to lead their students and how to how teaching pastors how to lead their church and 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 then leaders in nonprofits where they're volunteering and uh i've i've said this before and i i believe it's true but i don't really have a whole lot of evidence to back it up because i haven't worked with people in those those arenas the the nonprofits and and really leading students to to motivate them but one thing that i've said and i and i do believe that it's true i just you know if you disagree i'm i'm all ears cuz i don't want to be ignorant to it anymore but um leadership is like good leadership is good leadership no matter where you're at you know, no matter the people that you're leading, good leadership. If you're if you're a good leader, I think you can be successful in whatever uh, atmosphere that you're in. Um, would you agree with that? Or I, I think that that's that, that's true. I, um, you know, John Maxwell says that leadership is influence. Uh, it's the ability to influence other people. And when, when you break it down, that's probably the most simplest, best definition. To be a leader is to influence others and to get them to follow you. And 
the difference between a leader and a manager is that a manager tends to attract followers, whereas leaders attract other leaders. And that's probably the biggest difference that I have found as far as, you know, there's a huge difference between managing people and leading people. And you know, even management period, there's a big difference between leadership and management. Uh, the best way is as a metaphor, you know, management is like, uh, well, when you go to a go to Disney World or any of these amusement parks and you, you go up to the up to the ride and there's there's somebody there that's kind of checking you in that opens up the gate and they take your ticket or whatever and then they they seat you and then they make sure you're buckled in and then they push the button and they go around and on the roller coaster and you come back and they let you out and they show you where the gates that's management that is management that's all management is leadership is the person who designs the ride you know I want to be the one leaders design the rides. They are the ones that have the vision, you know, managers, all they do is work within a vision that's already there. So often leadership and management gets confused and managing people and leading people are actually two different things. Uh, because I think when you're leading, when you're actually leading and influencing, you're going to be attracting other leaders people that um, that have already felt a calling of some sort to lead in their own capacities. And, and that's where it gets, uh, um, you know, fascinating. And it's a it's an incredible. Um, um, just, I mean, there's so many different jumping off spots from that point. Yeah. What are some of the, the nuances of leading people in, in nonprofits where they're volunteering their time? Mm -hmm. And in actually teaching those people that they're volunteering their time, but they're also leading other volunteers. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is where I started to develop my own theory of motivation. I call it the growls, your stomach, when it's hungry, it growls. And these are inner needs that drive us. And it's an acronym. And when I work with, with people, with teachers in the classroom, it's the same way teachers in the classroom, uh, even though kids have to go to school, they today the student can be fairly resistant to that idea so you as a teacher have to work with them within their within their the drives are naturally going on and if you can if you can meet the need uh, feed the need I like to say feed the real need as opposed to using incentives and gimmicks and games and guilt and other things shame some leaders use that um, you know the, if you focus on how to, creating environments that naturally attract people. Uh, that's how you work with the, the difference with working with volunteers and paying somebody. Um, but here's the problem with paying somebody is that the paycheck, if the paycheck becomes the only motivation, you're still in trouble. Because, you know, once that paycheck no longer becomes a motivation, in other words, it's no longer meeting the basic security needs that they have to survive, they go get another job, you know? And, and that, it's, so you're constantly recruiting. And that's what I deal with with employers. Employers today are constantly recruiting help. And I say the best thing you can do is get the help and create an environment where nobody wants to leave. Same thing with, with nonprofits, same thing with pastors who work with volunteers or anybody who works with volunteers, create an environment that nobody wants to leave. And you do that by feeding the real needs. And the real needs, grace. I've already talked about how grace was a centering moment for me. As people, we are all driven to have an environment of grace. We want a serendipitous type of, of, of experience where there's surprise, there's blessing, there's beauty, there's forgiveness. You know, we, 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 we are attracted to those type of environments. The R is relationship. We, we all long to belong. We all want to be part of a community. I think when you think about your background in the Navy, you know, or in the, as a battalion chief and working with fire, firemen, I mean, there's a, there's a, a camaraderie there. There's a, a band of brothers, really, when you think about those types of, of situations. Well, why does that develop? It's because it's been created. It's a community that's been created. You're special for being in this, in this group. The O is ownership. Deep down, we all want to be large and in charge. We all want to be empowered. We all want to, we all want to do something. We want to make something. We want to just be something. And so, you know, this speaks to choice, this speaks to control, this speaks to contribution. And then the W in growls is worth. Deep down, we all want to sense our value. 
You know, we all want to, you know, share our voice. We all want to uh, feel like we're, we're validated in our life. We want to have validation. And so, you know, if you just focus, I call those the power needs. If you just focus on those four environments with, with your volunteers or your staff or your class, or even in the home with your family, these are, these are family values as well, creating an environment of grace and relationship and ownership and worth, G-R-O-W, what's that spell? Grow, yeah. That's how you grow a staff. That's how you grow your family as far as, or your students or your, your uh, volunteers. You grow their affection, you grow their attention. And then uh, the last are what I call the primitive needs. The primitive needs are laughter and security. We all want to be in, in pleasing, pleasurable, enjoyable, entertaining contexts. You know, if you're not having fun, people start checking out, you know, uh, and the same thing with security. The, and this is why when it comes down with employers, you, know, you got to be looking, you know, am I paying enough? You know, that's, a, that's the first thing you got to do to make, to make it uh, secure for, for a person. Yeah. So G-R-O-W-L-S, growls meet those and you create this this uh, attractive um powerful um productive uh, uh moment and you're not now you don't have to use incentives in fact you won't need incentives you won't need guilt you won't need shame you get you get this type of thing working from my experience kids start wanting to come to class they can't wait to come to class because the, their, their needs are being met kids in the home start behaving better uh, they start um, producing, they start getting it, they, they understand their role in the family. Uh, in, in, the, in the employee, in the workplace, employees start working, they're more productive, they're more, uh, uh, you know, they're just more connected. Every, everything works, everything's humming, you might say. It just, it just works, the growls. One of the things that I would say, there's got to be some similarities, but there there has to be some specific strategies, I think, to to lead students. And especially as the years go on, as the you know, there's there's generational differences. And and I and you talk about it in your in your book, but I'm wondering how you frame that in your book, the and and really what inspired you to write the book. Let's start there. How about that? <laughs> Well, what inspired me was I got ticked, you know, uh, like, you know, every, every book really is just an, an author getting upset. I've got to write this one out. I've got to figure this out. There's a problem here, or there's a bad idea. I got to respond to it. And the bad idea right now in generational analysis is this idea of Gen Z, you know, Gen Z. It's terrible. It's a terrible acronym or a terrible moniker. It's it's a bad label. It means nothing. And when that was attached to an entire generation of kids 20 years ago, I was like, somebody's got to start talking about this. And that was when I started to, to look at, um, in my doctoral work, I was already kind of grooving towards this way. Uh, we My doctorate's in leadership in the emerging culture. And so I did a lot of study in cultural shifts, cultural change. And when I took a historical big view, uh, a lot of people will often, when they, the work that I do, I'm, I'm sort of a futurist as well. And people will um, say, well, what's a futurist? And I say, well, we're just a good historian because all a futurist is, is someone who looks back and finds the patterns and then is able to predict what's to come. And you know, sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. But if, if, if you understand the patterns and you can see the patterns, and, and I've been highly trained in that area, it, it works um, in, in pretty remarkable ways. Well, here's the thing. When I started looking back about every 500 years, I was seeing a huge cultural shift and it was driven by technology. You know, 500 years ago, it was the Gutenberg press, the printing press, the mechanical clock and the, the scopes, the telescope and the microscope. Those, those, those three, four technologies really changed our culture, moved us out of a dark age world into a world of enlightenment, uh, renaissance, uh, reformation, you know, uh, industrial science ages as well. Well, what's happened is there's been three technologies that have emerged in the last, uh, well, almost 100 years now, but really 75 um, that um, have changed us, transformed us again. And 
television is the oldest one. Television moved us away from being a, an ear culture, a, an, an eye culture, where we, we, just, we just read something and, and that it moved us into a visual culture. We now think in images. Uh, the, um, the, the, the cell phone, the mobile phone has also flattened our world. And then finally, the internet. The internet just totally transformed how we do business, how we do everything really um, out there. So when I started thinking about generational analysis, I went, whoa, wait a minute. If there are these big shifts, could there not be micro shifts as well within generations? And so I applied that same thought there and I realized, wow, it's true. Every generation really, when we come of age, we do so between the ages of 10 and 25. Classically, puberty is 10 to 25 in a bright, and there's all sorts of different ways you can look at puberty and coming of age, as I like to call it. And when I started looking at that, there's about every 10 years, and I just, I, in the book, I go back to 1900, but every 10 years since 1900, there's been a technology. Most of them are communication technologies, by the way, but technologies that pop, you know, in the, in the first uh, 1900s, it was the telephone and the trans and transportation, motorized vehicles, airplanes, and and motorcycles and automobiles. But in 1910, a new technology called motion pictures started to pop. And then 1920, the radio, radio started to pop. In 1930, it was vinyl records that popped. Uh, in 1940, it was television that that popped. In, in, in 19 in 1950, it was space that started to pop 1960, you know, just on and on and on again. And as you, as you look at that, and what's interesting is, is when you look at this group we call Gen Z and probably the best way to look at them is they're all born since the year 2000 uh, because they don't remember. Uh, they have no recollection of uh, September 11th, 2001. So that's, that's not part of their frame, but when you look at them, they are defined by what I call the I technologies, Dave, uh, the I iPod iTunes, uh, iPhone, iWatch, iPad, all those, all those i technologies. So I call them the i tech generation. You know, to me, that better defines who they really are. And you know, I'm I was born in 1963, so I'm part of the space generation and the gamer generation. You know, those are the technologies that really frame my personality. Um, you know, and a lot of people like talk about video gaming today, but it's nothing like the old days. You know, I, I, I'll put a, I'll put you up on a game of Pong sometime. You watch these guys because they handle Pong, you know. Sure, you can handle, uh, you know, I don't know, Zelda or somebody like that. But try handling Pong. Pong will blow your mind. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, the ITEX. And the best way to understand them is that they're a, they're a 3D generation. I mean, if there's three characteristics, uh, they're 3D. They're, they're um, um, a digital, wholly digital generation they're diverse oh my goodness uh they are so diverse in their understandings in their cultural perspectives uh in uh in religious uh persuasion they're just very diverse and then uh they're decentralized and by that i mean that they're the first generation to come up where authority and where institutions have been collapsing and you know, it used to be that if you wanted to get to a lot of people, you went to the middle of the road or you went mainstream or you went mainframe or whatever. Now we're going towards the edges. Everything's moving towards the edges. The middles are collapsing and not are collapsing. They have collapsed in our culture. Um, middle, you know, the suburbs have, have become now people moving more to the country and, and more to the inner cities. Everything's the middles are collapsing. So, the, and there's a lot there. I mean, my goodness, you get, we could have talked just about the book all hour on that, on that one. So the iTech generation, and, and then you talk about the, the robo generation. So what are right. the, what are the characteristics of the robo generation? Again, remember these technologies are popping every 10 years. So the I technologies popped in the, in the, between 2000, 2000, 2010, that's when they popped. But in, in 2010, we had a new generation and what's popping right now is robotics. And so that's why I call them the robo generation. I think it was the 2019 Super Bowl. Uh, uh, Cause I was, I, when I got to this chapter of the book I had no idea what I was gonna uh, call this generation. Uh, I really struggled. And, and then um, 
I was as I was researching out, um, I, I just got into robotics as I was researching out the chapter. And I found um, a Super Bowl commercial, and I can't remember, it's some sort of um, um, trading company, I think it's called E trade or something like that. But they, they had a, a commercial where there was a guy that was asleep. And there was this robot that came up and said, wakey, wakey, Papa, wake up. And it was a uh, robo child, they introduced what they called robo child. And I went, that's it. Robo child, robots, robo generation. And, and since then I've defined the robo generation as being a, a, a generation that's growing up hairy. Their, their technologies are hair technologies, holograms, artificial intelligence, and robotics. Can you tell I like acronyms? Uh, <laughs> for me, acronyms are very easy to remember, but they're, they're hair technologies, holographic, artificial intelligence, robotics. And you're seeing them pop. And I'm, I'm basically proving my thesis here is that once a generation is born, about 10 years after, the popping will occur. And what's popping right now are robotics. If you, I mean, what's a drone? Drone is nothing more than a robot. Self-driving cars are nothing but robots. Um, when you, your smartphone is technically a robot without limbs. It cannot move, but it's already acclimating you to the idea of artificially intelligent robotic or, or humanoids, as we would call them. Uh, and it's just fascinating. When you get out there and start looking, uh, it's actually a bit creepy. That was the response to RoboChild, by the way. Uh, most people, when they did not like the commercial, the number one word for it was, this is creepy. Having a robot child wake me up in the morning. Wakey, wakey, Papa. But I got to tell you, wakey, wakey, buckle up, buttercup, because what's coming is going to blow your mind. Uh, by 2030, robots will be everywhere. They're already vacuuming your your uh, your front uh, your front uh, rooms. You know, wait wait till their lawn they're, they're a lawnmower out in the backyard. Uh, when I was in Sweden two years ago, uh, that was the thing I noticed in Sweden. Everybody and that's the big thing. You either have or you don't in Sweden, and the, the haves all have robot lawnmowers. They're everywhere. Everywhere you looked was robot lawnmowers. And I asked my Swedish friend, a relative who, who runs a shop who actually sells these things. I said, how long has Sweden had robot lawnmowers? And he said, 1995. You know, I was, I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. He said, yeah, that, you know, obviously if you can afford it, you put it in. If you can't afford it, you do the old fashioned mow job, but they can't use gas. There's no gas emissions in Sweden. So, you know, robots tend to be the best way to go, but it literally cuts the robot cuts the grass about every third day so that it, it's such a fine little trim where you don't catch the grass. So there's no need to catch it. There's no need to dispose of it. It just catches it and puts it right back into the grass every third day. So your grass looks perfect. You know, about after the third day, the grass starts looking a little scrap. In, in Sweden, all the grasses look absolutely gorgeous with these lawnmowers. But that's what's coming. You know, there's a, I was, there is a, a robot that they're designing right now that will be able, be able to be injected into the bloodstream that will be able to actually go and, and even do work on cancers. That's what they envision. Small enough robots to go, micro robots that will go into the bloodstream that will go to a cancer and, and cut out a cancer without actually having to open up a person. I mean, that, that's what these kids are going to experience in their lives. And for us, it's creepy. We look and I go, wow, that's, like I said, creepy. But for them, it's going to be like fish in water. They're already there. The iTechs and the, and the robo generation are growing up in a world that's completely different. And, you know, I'll just leave you with this thought. There was, there, the reason I started in 1900 was because there's been more technological change in the history of the world since 1900 than, you know, than ever. But since year 2000, there's been more technological change than in the previous century combined. Now, what we're going to see in the next 10 years is a transformation that I think will produce more technological change in the next 10 years by the year 2030 than we have had uh, in the last 20 years. It's, it really is going to be fascinating what's coming. You think you're going to title the next generation? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I, and th this is this is one of my problems with Gen Z, is that they were they were still in diapers when they it was a marketing firm I think out of New Zealand maybe Australia, I can never recall was one of those uh, down under countries, but they put Gen Z on and the whole reason they did Gen Z 
was because it was the next it was the next letter in the alphabet you know gen x gen y gen z because millennials were originally called gen y uh it, it's just it was it was it's crazy but you know I, I don't think you can really name a generation until they've gotten at least 10 years. So for me, about 2030, I'll, I'll probably write the next book where I'll add that chapter. But right now, um, I, I don't even want to, you know, I, I, I'm just happy with the fact that I'm proving my thesis right now, as the robots are exploding in our culture, that you're going to see uh, that the robo generation make a lot of sense. It makes, it makes perfect sense to call them the robo generation. So that's where I hope my book gets some traction. We have to just rethink how we look at generations and how we an analyze them. What, how, how do you define uh, people from my generation? That I, I was born in 74. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're born between 1970 and 1990, you're part of what I call the cable television generation, uh, for one. And, and also, again, the, the gamer generation. So remember, they overlap. If you think about it, a generation is 20 years long. And in my theory, you actually overlap. So you're part of two technological generations. If you're in, between 1960 and 1980, that's, you're in that range. That's the gamer generation because video games started to pop. And actually, Pong was 1972. So about, the, again, 10 years in, something pops. And it was, it was the games, the video games. But you're also part of the, the cable television generation, which, by the way, is one of the more unique generations out there. I wanted to initially call your generation the MTV generation. In fact, some have called your generation the MTV generation. The problem is, is that when you start looking at it, MTV wasn't the only influencer. You, you look at uh, how ESPN, you look at how HBO, you look at uh, uh, CNN, cable news, how that was really transformative um, media back in the, in the early 1980s, all those pop, well, I think HBO was 72, 73 it, when, it, when it came on the air, but uh, all the other ones popped between 1978 and 1983. In fact, your basic cable lineup, as we used to call it, was really created by 1983. You know, the, the, big, the big 20, the big 30 uh, original cable channels were all right there. Um, you know, later, the Foxes and the MSNBCs, as far as news go, they emerged in the 1990s. Um, but uh, it was it was really CNN was it, you know, when it came to news. In fact, they they, they made their uh, uh, big debut. If you remember Jessica, the baby Jessica that fell down in the wall. Well, you know, 